Well, good morning. Glad to see you managed to crawl out of bed better than I did. Uh, so I just got a little too excited yesterday, couldn't talk to very much. You know, you get into ventilation sessions and everything like this, and most of the time it's all about codes and, you know, fancy stuff or all the health thing. I wanted to get down and deal much more with really, if we go to a first slide up there to start with, we're going to mix between the slides and what I got on the table here. But uh, he's got to find my presentation, put that up. <clears throat> when you actually get it all installed, much of the time you'll find that it just ain't working. If you go to the next slide, you'll have that whole question of why doesn't it work. So we're going to look at a whole bunch of just little details that deal with some of the critical aspects of making ventilation work, but really getting down to the details themselves, maybe even a couple of tips to help you walk away with as we go through this. Um, and so uh, aside from just, you know, I don't need to give you the big speech that you need ventilation. And this lady tells me that she's got an off-reserve problem of mold in the bathroom and she suspects it's because there's no fan. You don't have to suspect that it's because there's no fan. It is because there's no fan. <laughs> when you just make a sauna and you have relatively mediocre insulation in the walls and the ceiling, you're going to get cold surfaces. And when you get cold surfaces and high humidity, you get condensation. And condensation that stays gives you mold. That's the whole theory course. You just got it. And in fact, I'll go over it one more time because if you actually tell the residents, particularly in your rental housing, drive it home instead of long spiels. You just say, if the beer mug is cold and it's humid in the summer, there's water on the outside of the mug. It just collects. And the same thing in the house. You have a cold surface, high humidity, you get water. So either we drop the humidity with ventilation, dehumidifiers, or whatever, or we raise the temperature of the surface. But as long as you leave it cold with high humidity, you get water. When you get water that doesn't go away, you get mold. And when you get mold, you get sick. It's that simple. <laughs> so we either wipe it down all the time and live with it so that it can't grow mold. Well, that's too hard to do in the corners and nooks and crannies of the house. And so we try to drop the humidity. And many houses, they're all electrically heated in Quebec. We get down so dry that we're drying up like old prunes. We talk like this all the time in Quebec <laughs> because we're down to 20% relative humidity in a normal house and we're having to add humidity to the house. In many other houses where you have a large population or you don't have proper ventilation, now you're finding out that it's getting too wet. And so the ventilation help drops that down. And then the other thing, the permanent solution is really good insulation of the walls, no thermal bridging, and circulation of air. Okay, let's get down to the details of really how that works. If we go to the next slide, there's this great sort of industrial slide, the equivalent duct links. And this you may have seen in some of the textbooks, it's kind of interesting, but we're going to actually play with it here, is basically what we see here is that a straight duct has a certain resistance to airflow. Just a straight metal hard ducting like this will slow down air, not very much, but there's a little friction on the edges. And so it does slow down a little bit. So that's, we compare everything to a straight duct, a straight metal duct that's smooth. And this is our ideal airflow. Now, the larger the duct is, the less resistance there is. Just because for the square area of, of air moving through, there's less surface touching. As you get smaller, the surface is a larger proportion of the whole flow. And so the friction becomes more important. But what's interesting, if you take here on the bottom corner here, the two times thing, that's the flexible duct, particularly this plastic garbage that uh, you can buy so easily in the stores because it has that rib in it. It causes turbulence, and it's never really straight, even if you try. And so what happens with that is right off the bat, that'll give you two times as much resistance as this will in terms of air getting to the other end. And then if we go back to that diagram, you'll see the elbows start to make a big thing. Let's uh, find just a regular elbow in here. Well, I've got a 45 degree elbow is equal to five feet of duct length. A 90 degree elbow is gonna be 20 feet of duct length, well, if it's flexed duct there, you're 90 degree and a slow turn is only 10 feet because you're letting the air sneak around the corner instead of bumping it into a 90 degree turn. And then you start doing some of these, you can see some of these things to get as much as 60 feet or 50 feet in a single joint. 
And back uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation did research, I think it was back in 1980 something, where they went out in Ottawa and they went out to a whole bunch of houses and they measured the real airflow was coming out of an ordinary bathroom fan that was installed. And they found it went everywhere from the value that the fan was rated at to zero. Okay? The, and it was almost half of them. The fan spun, it made noise. But there was zero coming out the other end because this snake, you know, sort of like the Chinese dragon snake running through the attic, had so much resistance that that tiny little fan couldn't push anything out the other side, or at least couldn't open the damper to get it to open up and let the air out because the damper itself gave some resistance. So when you add that all together, it came out that half of those bathroom fans were doing zero. So they had a fan, they had the noise, nothing was going on. And you wonder why you had the humidity. So the installation becomes really important in that. And that's one of the things that bugs me in a lot of seminars is that you just get told you need to put in an HRV, or you need to put in a bathroom fan, and you don't really understand how important that really is. Now I'm gonna try to show you here. You're gonna come up and help me too. Um, what I've got here, and you, you, we, you can't see it where you are, that's why we're going to really work with the camera and have this come up. If you look at the table right now, and you see we've got the flex ducting here. This gadget here is a pressure meter. Actually, it's a gadget that we use to balance HRV systems, if you're familiar with that, to make sure we have the same amount of air going out of the house as the air coming into the house. Now, I'm just using one end of it, and we're going to put it right into this flex duct here, and my friend is going to hold that up because it actually needs to be perfectly perpendicular to work a little bit there. So if you can just hold that in place. Now let's just bunch this all up together first. So that we've got, now this is a three inch duct, but it's down to about two or two and a half inches because of all the ripples in it, but it's a straight run. So now if we hold that for just a second and turn it on. Fan's turning, yeah, okay, we've got air coming through here. Now you see the manometer is wanting to barely, barely move there. In fact, it's looking a little crooked. Let me just see if this needs to, yeah, this has, you can't lift it that high. We've got to straighten this out or it doesn't work. There we are. We've got a zero coming up there. Oh, we're getting close to zero. There it is, you see. So, now, if I put my hand on the end and block the air, you'll see that there's pressure inside showing in the duct. So I'm just stopping it right now. And when I let that come out, you'll see that we're down to, well, we're actually, it's calibrated just a little below zero. That might just be the way the camera is looking. Turn that a little this way. It's a thing I learned in television. If you change the camera angle, you can change the reading on a meter. So if you need it to read a little higher, a little lower, you move the camera over and it looks great. It really makes demonstrations work much better. Now, if you hold that tight there, and I'm just going to make this a longer duct. And try to keep it straight. Don't go away anywhere. We'll just get this out here relatively straight. And we created a fair amount of resistance just by making it a long duct. And that's what it said in that equivalent duct length thing. It said it's twice as long as it really is because of all these ribs. Now, if I bring this back, if I can do this at all decently. Oh, this thing's like a live. Okay, so we're fairly straight. You got that in straight? What's our meter doing now? I'm going to go to the other side. Let me just, I can work better over here. You can't see it anyway, so we'll, you'll have to see it on the screen. So if we come back like this, you can give us a shot of the meter, Jessica. You can come down. Okay, so we've got about a one going on there. I throw a U-turn in it, and we have more than doubled the resistance in this. And we could throw a little bit more of a U-turn in it, so I've actually zigzagged this duct around, and we've almost tripled the resistance in the line. And we've only gotten a foot further. Okay, we haven't made much distance, but we certainly slowed the air down. And when you've got these relatively small fans in the bathroom, and they're trying to draw out, and you've got this snake running up like that, now you add to that that in the attic, you get a little bit of this stuff going on, right? So you get dips and up and down. The bottom of the dip fills up with water with condensation. It grows mold. And mold, I'll call it blowing out of the house, so it doesn't bother anybody, but what it does is it grows a garden down there. You could harvest it and put it in your salad if you wanted to, you know, it's, it's good mushrooms. But it blocks the airflow. And in fact, we have gone into attics and we found vents, even vents that are better than this, using like the metal 
flex ducting, but that have bent down and actually were full of water. There was no air movement because the water had filled it up and there was just nothing going on. And so that's why when you're actually setting up a bathroom exhaust fan, if you're going into the attic, you want to go up from the fan high enough that I could go down on a plumbing run to the outside with a straight hard line. If I got to use a little flex to connect between the fan and the, and the, the duct, that's all right, you know, because it's really hard to make those connections. So that first little bit, you can use some flex duct. Ideally, the metallic one, because it's smoother on the inside. And then you get this downhill run with all the joints set up so that any condensation drips out the other side. And ideally, go out the gable end where it's straight up and down. Because what happens when you go out the soffit? I know in Ontario they allow this. They don't allow it in all of Canada. Ontario is kind of a strange province. They allow all kinds of garbage. But when you go out the soffit, the hot air turns around and goes right back up the soffit and into the attic. Okay? So it goes out the soffit. Theoretically, you're supposed to block the soffit for three feet on each side so the wind will blow the stuff away before it can get into the attic. Well, didn't we put the soffits there to ventilate the attic to stop the ice dams? Okay, so now we're blocking it up to get this stupid thing going out there. I actually have a film showing a HRV installed in a house that I bought. I love this. That had the HRV coming out the soffit here and six inches away was the intake. We put smoke in the system and we actually have it showing it going out and back into the house. Okay, we filled the basement with smoke by exhausting it out of the bathroom. Okay, because it wasn't on recycle. It was recycling outdoors and coming right back in. Don't use the soffits. Go out to the gable in and dump. Now, this lady's got a problem of her bathroom. And one of the things I suggested, she says, can we go out the sidewall? Yeah, but it's really a short duct. And the cold comes back. And particularly the wind can come back in. And then you'll get complaints and they'll block it off. They'll tape it off shut with duct tape. Well, what's the best thing to do with that is to drop a hood down that goes down about, well, about a foot. I've actually seen some at 18 inches that drop the air down. That makes the fan work a little bit harder, but the wind doesn't come back in. And you don't have the cold air. See, cold air goes downhill if there's no wind. So it won't fall into this fan. If it's going straight through the wall, and I got little louvers here, those louvers never work. They're always frozen open. Okay? And so the wind just flows into the bathroom, and people will definitely shut that down. So if you've got cold drafts, ventilation doesn't work because people turn it off. And we'll talk about noise later, which also gets them turned off as you're going. So this is a stupid little demonstration with a tiny little computer fan because that's all I could fit in my suitcase. But I think that even just by showing that, you were able to see that we doubled and tripled the resistance of airflow right here with just a couple of things. Okay, good, thank you. So that's the equivalent duct length. You really have to think about it and work on it. Now, even if you're not getting scientific, if you're not trained as a HUVAC guy and you don't know how to calculate duct lengths and everything, just get in your head. As much as we can use rigid straight duct, we do. When you've got to use a flex duct, try to get the metallic flex duct. And if you've got to use this stuff, stretch it out as straight as you can because now it's getting smooth inside. So if I stretch that out, it's not too bad. And I'll do little joints because that's, you know, from my fan to the duct. Uh, it's not much of a distance so we can get by. But I don't want to do that from the fan to the duct. I want to do that. All right? And it makes a difference. And if we could drive that home to people, you'll suddenly find the equipment you already have in the house can work two, three times better than it ever has without even changing out. Okay? So your airflow. Now, another thing in airflow. Oh, come back up here. I forgot. We got one more little demonstration. There's changes going on in, in the industry because we're starting to figure out different ways of, of doing things. And one of it has to do with our grills, particularly with uh, HRVs and stuff. For years and years, we've always promoted that what we want to do is put a grill up high in the wall. The air is going to come in on the ceiling. And we have the louvers pointing up, not down, so that it flows across the ceiling. Now, the reality is, this louver actually blocks it up a bit. If we go, I think we've got a slide here that you'll see <coughs> a photo. This is, I've taken this louver. That's the louver I've got in my hand. And I bent these veins straight just to show you. Now, we're starting to manufacture them this way. They're hard to find. 
but they're straight on one side. Well, yeah, you can see this right well there. You see how you can see right through the clearance there? Now, if I turn it this way, over here, there we are, you see that there's a pretty good open space, but it's at 45 degrees, but it's not even as good as that one. If you show us the next slide, you'll see side-by-side -side comparison. That's looking straight into the liver, the bent ones at 45 degrees, the other ones. So you see, even the space between the veins is larger when it's straight forward than it is at 45. Now let's just turn this gadget back on and show you a resistance that we get. If we just bunch this up so we get as good a passage as possible. And what are we getting up on? Okay, so we're down to about zero on the meter. If I bring my 45 degree ventilator in front of it, we just jumped up a little bit, okay? And now I put my straight one in front of it. Did it go back down? Yes, it did. You see how it jumps up? The same gadget, bent straight, gives me almost twice as much airflow as the one that has the angle on it. And that becomes more and more important as we're moving on. We're going to see a bit of that in just a minute in terms of new arrangements we're starting to make with uh, heat recovery ventilators and where we position them. But we will be moving more and more to open straight vents as opposed to these ones. And one nice thing is when you put that straight vent up high, you don't see through it as much as you think. See, usually when we look at this one up high and you look up at it, you don't see through it and that's what they like, you don't see through it. And over here you do. But when it really gets up high, you see it starts to hide, it starts to hide the hole. So it doesn't look as bad as you might think. But we're getting much better airflow. And so if you start to find these in the stores, it's not going to happen for another year or so, but when you start to find them in the stores, you want to know, why are they doing that? It works better. Okay, so we're getting a little away from aesthetics and more into making it actually function. Thank you. Now, in the next slide, we're going to take a look at duct sealing. And you may be aware that the Ontario Code actually requires that ventilation or at least heating systems be sealed totally when in new construction, and we encourage going back. First of all, duct tape. Duct tape, that stuff on the red-green show, the stuff that you can most commonly buy in the hardware stores that you can't even get off the roll because it sticks very well, it's real gummy. You need to keep in mind that the only proper use for duct tape is to tie up the kids when they're making too much noise. Okay? That's the only thing, you, you know, cops can use this when they don't have handcuffs. Okay? Because it's really hard to get out of. But it's useless for anything else and it shouldn't even carry the name duct on it. You put this cloth back, sticky duct tape on a duct, particularly if it's a hot air duct, and within six months it loses all of its cloth. And you get this sort of dry mesh that's falling all over the place. You know, you've seen that. It's garbage. Don't use it. Duct tape is only for kids or for red green. Okay? Now, how many of you use the aluminum back tape? Okay. You want to come up here and help me here? Come on. H how does it go when you want to tear this apart and open it up a piece? You have a trouble getting the backing off? You, you do have some problems, huh? Let me come out here and come on over here because we want the camera to see this really well. Turn yourself a little because we're going to talk to the camera here. Show me how you tear off just a little piece there. Well, now that one's already set up for you. That's too easy. Tear one off. Okay. And it's really a pain, right? It is, yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to show you something. And then you do it afterwards. If you start, let's see if we can see this well. Okay. Well, actually, I'll turn it this way so the camera can see it. I'm going to tear it halfway down like that. And then I'm going to go the other halfway. Now see if you can tear that apart. It's always got an open edge. Try that. Tear halfway down and halfway back. That's it. And now it opens up. He likes that. That was worth the whole conference. Okay. <laughs> so let's do it one more time here. If we can get this on the camera really right. Are we up there? Getting close. There she is. So we're going to come halfway down like this. We're going to just keep tearing, but I'm going to change sides. And always one edge of that is going to be open. The other will not be. Okay? And suddenly it becomes easier to use your aluminum duct tape. So that's one key to using this stuff. And the nice thing is you can 
don't have to do big long strips because when you do of course it sticks to itself and it sticks to your elbow and everything else so you can do little pieces and patch them together there's a new one out that I have not tested I only found it last week from tuck tape that is aluminum it's thinner and there's no backer plate and they claim it does as good for ducks I've seen no testing on it yet but just to know it is in the stores okay so that is a possibility if you're really tired of using that backer tape. What we do have testing on is that this stuff works pretty well. Certainly a lot better than the cloth duct tape. Now, in really professional installations, we will only use this in places where we want to open it later, like access hatches. Because you can take a knife, slit it, open it up, put it back, put more tape on the top, and everything works fine. You don't have to take the tape off. So if you need access, you use this. But the real permanent stuff is actually a mastique. Let's see if we get the uh, slide, the next slide. Do I have a mastique on the next slide? Yeah. See this guy with the paintbrush working on that? This is a real gummy stuff called duck mastique. And anytime there's a crack or a hole that's more than an eighth of an inch, there's a fiberglass tape. Now, this is not drywall tape. This is a duct, ducting tape. It's a fiberglass mesh that bridges the eighth inch up to, I think, as much as uh, half or three quarters and then you put on this mastique. It's gooey, terrible stuff. Most people do not do it gently with a brush. They stick their hand in the bucket and they put it on with a glove. Okay, so just a plastic glove on your hand, but you get a very thick plastic glove because what do you have in all this sheet metal? Sharp edges. So if you do it with a little, one of those little uh, stuff in the grocery stores, that doesn't work. Okay, so you get something a little bit heavier. It's messy, terrible work, but it's permanent. It really seals. It really works. And more and more, that's what we're using for our primary air sealing of ductwork, of all your ductwork. But when you don't have that, then you can get into taking the aluminum and even in small pieces and putting it together. And we never use the mastic for an excess hatch because it's too hard to open. It's, it's gummy. It stays sort of hard to get to. And so don't do it. So we'll keep this in the toolbox. And we'll use this for anything that we might want to open later. And anything that's permanent, hidden away in a corner, closed into a wall, is all done with mastic. And you get an air sealing. Why is that important? You saw the air leakage here. Well, in many, many installations, we're finding as much as half of all your fan pressure is lost through those holes. The air leakage is just losing the pressure. Well, you say, you know, I myself used to say, it's not so bad. The furnace is putting the hot air out and it's getting lost in the walls of the house, so it's warming the house. I'm not going to worry about it. It's not like going through the attic or going through the basement. It's, it's in the house. The only problem is it's not getting to the grill. So it's not getting into the room where I needed it to get to, and it's not getting there with the same pressure and speed that I'd hoped for, because it lost that along the way. And that's what air sealing ductwork is doing. Just as we take the bends out and straighten these things out, if you seal them up, Again, you're getting more of that fan on the other end. And the more we can get delivered to the other end, the smaller the fan can be. Because the fan can be smaller, quieter, cheaper, and less money to operate for the amount of air I've got coming out the other end. So by cutting all these losses between the fan and the grill, we actually have the opportunity to design down the sizes because we're actually delivering more out where we need it and getting it to come through. That's where all of a sudden this equipment starts working the way they tell you it was going to work. And you put it in the house, mm, it's not doing what we expected. Okay? Because we're not delivering on the other end exactly what we need. Um, if we can get the next slide. Here's a slide that I actually pulled out of the Reader's Digest uh, book only because I uh, did the Canadian edition of the Reader's Digest book, so they let me use all their pictures. Um, this is a traditional heating system that you'll find in many houses where you have a basement <clears throat> where basically your heating system is throwing hot air under the window. And for years, I preached to everybody, why is the grill under the window? It's because the window is the poorest part of the wall. It needs the most heat. Don't cover it with all kinds of blinds because it'll just get full of water. You see, the moisture will get there, but the heat won't get there. So that's why we flow it up. And if if you have clients in your rental housing that put those deflectors on the floor that push the air into the room, that guarantees the wall's going to rot out. 
because it pushes the air away from the cold window where we need to stop the condensation. Okay, so I always tell the consumers, I say, if you have those deflectors, I would like you to assume a Zen meditation position, think about it for a little bit, and then stand directly in front of that little plastic deflector, jump up in the air, and land on top of it. Okay, and then we will have solved the problem. Okay, we want that air to go up the window because it's fighting the cold air that's trying, see, you've got hot air on the top of the room, but it hits the window. It gets cold and starts to fall. And that's why, particularly on a patio door or a very large window, you'll feel the draft, even if there's no leaks in the wall. You'll feel the flow of air coming down. So we fight it with the hot air going up. This has not always been the way that we've heated, particularly in the prairies and in really cold climates. In Winnipeg, for instance, for many, many years, a long time ago, they put everything in the middle of the house and they actually drew down the cold air from the bottom of the window and threw the hot air across the room. Well, that worked in a day and age when we had master dome size heating units in the basement and fans that you could take off on the runway out here. You know, they were just so powerful, they were shoving air across the house. And then I went into a house one day, a lady at a home show in Winnipeg forced me to come to her house and see her problem because we didn't believe it. She had that system, the old thing, but they of course modernized it and put a, a smaller heating system in and slowed the fan down and got it more energy efficient and all of this. And her sofa was frozen to the wall. Okay, so she couldn't pull the sofa out because it was stuck to the wall with ice. And what was happening was that there was not enough power anymore to throw the hot air all the way across the room. And so it never got to the window. So the hot air went about halfway and fell into the room and that wall got colder and colder and colder and you formed. She actually had about six inches of ice building up on the wall inside her house. Okay, just because there was no hot air getting to that edge. Now, if you go to the next slide, we're shifting things a little bit. We're taking these units and going back to the old way with smaller heating units. And we're finding new design techniques that are starting to come out of Ontario that are saying with our super energy efficiency, where our walls and our windows are getting better and better, and we're learning how to handle air better, we can actually design a house that saves a ton of work and money because we're not running ducts all over the place. We're running them up the middle of the house. And we're taking our cold air return off the floor like that. That's an easy one. And then the top, we're just shooting out. But this time, we're worried more about what we call throw. Okay, and throw is how far will the air go? That's where these open grills come in. Is that with that throw, we're finding that we actually do smaller heating systems with a more pressure available from the fan, all controlled in our ductwork that's well designed and not a bunch of 90 degree elbows giving us trouble. And we're blowing easily all the way across the room and down to the floor on the far side. We're actually being able to measure now when they do this right, that there's a hot air flow all the way to the floor under the window. And suddenly the old system is starting to work and be more efficient than what we've done since we got rid of the old system. And so you may see some radical changes coming because you can imagine in terms of what's going on in the basement. You know, you got that ductwork running all over the place trying to get to the uh, under the windows. If we don't have to get it there anymore and we can run that all up the middle of the house, you've saved a whole bunch of space and trouble and even cost of ductwork. And you've done it by doing a more intelligent use of the fans that you've had, the ductwork, and the grills. And so you're actually measuring these things so that it can get out there. So when you're talking with your contractors, this is not well known in this study. It's only begun to be pushed about a year ago. But we've seen more and more designs starting to come out saying, yes, this works in an energy efficient house. Good insulation, good windows, we can do this. And all of a sudden, the whole game changes. It also makes it more idiot proof because the renters are not covering ducts with grills and things like that. So it's, it becomes more idiot proof because it's out of their access and it's just working. So that may be a trend that you see coming. If you see it coming, don't say, oh, no, 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 you got it wrong. It, now, if you do it, 
without all the rest of the details to get that air flowing right, it's not going to work. The air <laughs> falls into the room. Okay. Now understand where the hot air grill is and the pressure that it's throwing is the most important. The return air, it'd be nice if it was there collecting what we wanted to get rid of. So if it was on the floor collecting cold air in the wintertime, or if it was in the ceiling collecting hot air in the summertime, there's a marginal advantage to that. But it's not fantastic because when you actually take instrumentation and measure hot air coming out, you can measure an airflow way out here six feet away. I could actually put a gadget out here and I feel the airflow. But on the return draw, you get four inches away and you don't feel anything because it's diffusely drawing it in. It's not in a line. It's not coming in like this. When I shoot it out, it's in a line. I, I've shot it. I've aimed it. I sent it someplace. And, but when it's coming in, it's just going all around. So we're discovering the position of the cold air return is less important than we thought. And the position and the grill of the hot air source is more important than we thought. Okay, so we're slowly turning our thinking around. Let's go to the next slide. And I think that you'll relate to this one a great deal. Um, the mold and mildew and the corners and things like that. Now this is a classic case of mold. And if you looked at this with thermal imaging, you would clearly see that that, well, first of all, a corner is the coldest part of a house because it's actually the point of three surfaces, two walls and a ceiling. And it's got cold all around it. And so that corner, which also happens to be a whole bunch of lumber, which is not a very good insulator and very little insulation, particularly if there's no insulated sheathing on the house, there's no insulation going right in there. And in some cases, the lumber is warped a little bit and everything, so it's not necessarily closed down tight. And there's actually air coming between the double header coming into the drywall. And that's why the corners, northeast, northwest corners of the house, are the first places to get the mold. Coming down this wall would mean that they built that poorly and that they, when they put the stud walls up, somebody forgot to put insulation in the corner. And so that's why you'll see that there are design details now for building walls that don't box the corner in. The reason, you know, we used to just take a wall, stand it up, and take a wall, stand it up. And in the corner, you actually had to go around the outside and put the fiberglass in to get it in there because there were two by fours like this making a corner. And this side needed to be filled. Well, of course, the fiberglass guy didn't get there until after somebody covered the wall. And so it never got anything. Now we're building them in staggered positions so that this wall goes up, this one comes up to it, and I can get around with my fiberglass. So you need to be a little careful about that to avoid that vertical one there. Well, what I'm really talking about is a cold surface, whether it's just a line, whether it's a whole wall, the cold surface, the humidity for a long time, that's causing mold. So if we go to the next slide, which doesn't really show us a lot of anything except to see the double header up there. I got lots of insulation in the attic. I got my insulation in the wall. What do I have? I got ventilation coming out from the soffit that's just pissing on that double header and going into the attic. So the double header is minus 28 degrees. And it's not worth, it's about 1.2 R per inch. So we don't have a lot of insulation and we're right to the drywall and you want to know why the top of that wall gets mold on it. So if you don't have insulated sheathing in a retrofit situation, a lot of your old houses are built exactly like that. Open the soffit and put about a six inch strip of styrofoam against the double header. It's up above the soffit. You don't see it. You don't have to do anything with styrofoam. Just put it in there. Glue it in place if you can. Okay, and cover that piece of wood and you'll find the mold disappears on the inside. One little retrofit trick that we've done. You know that fancy molding you can buy in the big cove? We should have some here, no? No, we don't have any here. But you know the fancy molding in the corners and it's mostly made out of foam insulation? Well, they made it out of foam insulation because it was a cheap way to make cool looking molding. And they didn't think about it. But actually it has a good R factor. Because <laughs> it's polyurethane. And it's foam insulation. If you were to glue that into that house that has a problem along that edge up there, what did you just do? You added about an R5 of insulation over the double header. And the mold goes away by adding decoration. So there are times when you can do that. If you don't want to get that fancy, you put a, uh, a styrofoam strip that covers it on the inside and then a little drywall to cover that. You've got a funny notch, but it looks kind of cool. But most important, stops the condensation because I don't have that cold, cold, cold spot collecting the moisture. 
right? So the other part of that, though, if you go to the next slide, your really simplified basic principle. She's going to do something. You're going to move my mic. She's going to try to make my mic so it works better so I don't have to shop. She's worried about that she's going to have to finish the demonstration because I can't talk anymore. Okay. <clears throat> do you want to beat mold? Simple. Raise the temperature of the surface or reduce the humidity. Okay. So the last one, ventilate, that reduces humidity. That's one way to reduce humidity. But the other one is to improve the insulation. Just talking about that. Stop cold air drafts, and by that I mean the air that actually moves through the wall and chills the wall as it comes through. So around windows and up in those corners, if the air is actually moving through, it's going to chill the surface. And aside from cold air drafts, we get a cold spot that collects moisture. But the other one is circulation. And here's one that I really suggest that you can work with on the reserves very easily if you get the concept across. There are some books that say we need a minimum of three inches space between anything in a wall or anything in a cold floor to stop it. You can actually get away with a lot less. There's these multi-tiles you can buy in the hardware store. Little tiny feet on one side, it's an open grid, sits on the floor, they lock together. Okay? Simply putting this on the concrete floor, putting your cardboard boxes on the top, the cardboard boxes don't wick the moisture up from the concrete anymore. They don't lock the moisture in the air there. Yes, the concrete's cold. It might be moist, or it might just be the moisture in the air. But by having, one, it's a capillary break. We don't have a direct connection between wood or cardboard and the concrete. But there's actually a little air circulation here. And I've gone into cold storage rooms where we've had problems on the walls. And I've glued these to the walls. And I filled the walls with these things. And then they put their stuff in. You try to tell them, leave a space. They don't do it. You know. So they shove it up against, but they can't get to the concrete. And it's amazing how much of the problem that helps to resolve. Now, in a really difficult situation where there's a lot of humidity and you can't get the humidity down because of lifestyle, there's 27 people in one room, whatever it is, then you start setting up fans. And these don't have to be heaters or anything. We just move air. And if we have some kind of spacing, air going through there will move the humidity along and help to reduce the problem. So anything that separates it off. Now, if you're going to put wood slats for this, you have to do one of two things. You have to use pressure treated wood or a little bit of plastic. And when I say plastic, I'm talking simple. It could be garbage bags. It could be shopping bags. Just a piece of plastic between the wood and the concrete. So if it's white wood, it's not protected, all that is is what we call a capillary break. The moisture can't go from the concrete to the wood. So if we're putting little sleepers down, one by twos, and you want to stack stuff up, just make sure that the bottom of the one by two actually has some plastic on it. Right? And then that just separates the concrete. And then you get the airspace. And then you can have cardboard. You can have storage. You can have all kinds of things. And so if you're going into a rental unit, if you build this in, you know where they're going to store all that crap. If you could build in spacing that's ventilated before they put the stuff in, you'll find that you've eliminated most of the mold in that basement. And if it's not enough, just a simple fan blowing under there can actually do something to make it move, make it circulate, make that change. So air circulation is one of the major things that we find is very useful for stopping that condensation, create the air circulation, stops the mold. Now, when your ventilators and everything are placed right and we're projecting right, it takes care of itself to a great extent. When you're in tough areas, like closets, you come in, you take all the raincoats, you throw them in a closet, and you close the door of the closet, and the mold forms in the back. Well, let's add some little, let's, let's steal two inches and put styrofoam on the cold wall in there. And then you've got to put some drywall to protect it from fire. So you, you do that in the corner. And then the rest of it, you open grills in the door. You make sure the top and the bottom of the door are short. It doesn't fit. It's like the bathrooms you saw at the early part of the show. You know. <clears throat> Everybody says, well, you know, they used to make doors that fit, and they don't anymore. That's because we want the air to move. That's why we cut the bottom of the door a little bit, make sure the air can circulate and get out. OK? Let's see. We've got all kinds of time here, so we're doing fine. If we look at the next slide, we're going to talk about noise. One of the problems with fans is they get turned off when they're noisy. OK? So your 1995 bathroom fan, <clears throat> after two months of use, sounds like this. 
and he gets turned off. Nobody uses it. Okay, they'll unplug it, they'll tape it over, they'll do anything, get rid of it. It's just lousy. These kind of fan blades make noise. They're really noisy, whether they rattle or not. Usually, they're also cheap enough that they rattle pretty quickly, or they get crap on them that's in an unbalanced way, so now they start to shake, and you get into trouble. When you get to the squirrel cages or something like that, they get quieter. <clears throat> so unfortunately, as you add money to a bathroom fan, you cut down the noise. So like a 1995 goes, you know, you pay 50 bucks and get, you know, you pay 90 bucks and get, and by the time you get to $150, you've got to put a light on it to know they turned it on because you can't hear it. But another little detail about it, this is my fan, and if we're right here, turn this on. You can hear that. Yeah, I'm not even blowing air in here. I'm just the noise of the fan is coming through. But as soon as I get away from it, even pointing at it still, you don't hear. So how close you are to the fan is part of the noise situation, which means that often the bathroom fans that are all one unit, and they're all made that way, they're right there. If you don't have a good one, it's going to drive people crazy. If that's the only fan that you're going to get, you might want to see if there's a way to move the fan itself further away halfway down the duct. So there's not right there. And so there's a duct coming in, and maybe you've got a round grill in the bathroom, and your fan motor is halfway to the exit. It works just as well, whether it's right there or on the other end. But you've cut the noise down, because you've moved away from the actual turbulence of the fan, and then the duct work will, will sort of di dissipate that noise to some extent. The other noise you get is about fan speed. And it's interesting when you think of, of you know, just doing it with your own mouth. If you blow air out, it just doesn't make any noise. And as you close your lips down, you get a little bit more noise. And then you get a whistle. The worst thing you get in the heating system is a whistle. And we have some heating systems like our high velocity systems. And the worst of them have these little tiny outlets Theoretically, they do a great job of heating. But if they hit the whistle point, they drive you absolutely insane. You're sure you have tinnitus or something else, and you've got this, this hum in your head that's driving you crazy. And so, yes, we need to push air, and we need to project air, and we need to have throw of the air going out. But you don't want to have either grills or anything else that cause that whistle. And sometimes the whistle comes from just two pieces poorly joined together. And we've got air sneaking out through that joint. And somewhere along the line, it just hit that harmonic, and you get a whistle. And you're trying to figure out where it is. And a little tape, and the whistle goes away. So you do need to work hard at that. I just realized as I picked that up that I had another little demonstration I wanted to show you here. Uh, well, let's just finish up on this noise. The speed of the air, the shape of the grill, and the distance from the fan is what deals a lot with those noise things. Here's a straight duct. And it's got a joint on one end and the other end straight. Now, of course, you cut it. And as soon as you cut it, you've got a homosexual duct. There's no longer uh, a male and a female end. This is a lesbian duct. Um, so how do we change a homosexual to a bisexual here? is that you've got to do something again. Now, the real official way to do it, and if you're dealing with rigid ductwork a lot, you should buy a nifty little pair of pliers like this. And you see I've got five blades here. So when I take this and I put it up and I squeeze it here, it makes that little ripple. And then I can come over. Actually, you should go the other way. If this thing come in. No, that's right. It goes this way. And it starts to ripple that down. Now, it's long and slow to work your way along, but you're actually reproducing very close to that original edge as you go through there. Okay? So that will eventually match this in terms of reducing it and giving you a very nice fit to come down. Now, of course, most of you have learned there's another way to do this when you're stuck in a pinch is you just take a pair of needle-nose pliers. Now, needle nose pliers, if I take them and give them just a little twist, 
I can actually start to create that same thing, not nearly as perfect, but it works as you come around. Now you'll notice that this is quite uneven compared to the other one. And in fact, the worst thing that somebody can do, and I've seen this done, is to make it work. They'll come up here, and they'll bend that in, and they'll bend that in. Now that's a lot faster, I do agree. Okay, and we'll probably actually manage to get this thing to fit into the other one. If we just work on it a little bit here. There we go. So that goes in. And you say, oh, I've got a nice fit here. Now, I want you to take a look down the inside. Can you actually see right through it? Yes, you can. Yeah, I've got to get this line. If I look at the camera, there you see. You see how much air obstruction I've made? And if I actually build this backwards, so you're coming... You see, that one works pretty good. This one is terrible because it's catching all the air in those bends. Okay? So sure, it looks good for the inspector on this side, but it's garbage on this side coming in. And so there's a real difference. Even the airflow of going in this direction or going this direction would be different because one of them is basically a trap. There's pockets, and the turbulence would be terrible. The other one at least isn't a trap, but it's reduced the size. So bothering, even if you're using the needle nose pliers, to try to reproduce this small little ripple makes a difference in the airflow. Okay? So it might even be worthwhile if we were to set up a test and show that to you, but that's something to take a look at when you're trying to get by. The worst one I had was a ring gutter in my own house. I, uh, it was always jamming with leaves. I bought this house. I didn't build it. I bought it. And I went and took the, it was two-story rain gutter, and I went and took it apart, and I found out the guy had jammed, he had bent it in so much that he jammed two feet. He didn't want, he didn't have, I guess he didn't have snips with him. He had no way to cut it. So he just bent that V two feet long and jammed it in until it fit at the right place. And I had the opening about that big down on the bottom for the, all the leaves and everything to come through, you know. It was just absolutely ridiculous, but you don't see it. It was gorgeous on the outside color matched perfectly the top and bottom and everything else. These kind of things, when you're stuck with this, yes, you can use the needle nose pliers, but take the time to do a lot of little bends so that we come up with something like this. Let's just look at these two next to each other. And you see that's a whale of difference in terms of what we're gonna get for airflow through there. Okay? Now those things make a difference. That's the biggest thing I wanna drive home to you here. Let's take a look, um, as we're talking about noise, if we go to the next slide, I thought this was interesting. I dug this up on the internet. I wanted to show you a way that noise moves through ducts. Next uh, slide here. This is actually World War II marine voice pipes that were on ships. You know, you've seen it in the old films. The captain talks into a pipe and goes down. It's really cool because if you look at this, you see this one's all covered in white. They actually insulated the outside of the pipe to stop other noises from getting in and interfering. Uh, but that's the way they communicated as recently as World War II, from the engine room up to the cabin uh, in these ships because it did not depend on electricity. You know, sometimes it was only a backup system at this point, but uh, it meant that everything's out. You could still talk to the guy down there and give some directions. The problem with that is that in your house, the noise follows the ducts. The better your duct is set up for ventilation, the better the noise goes through. So we're into a contradiction between noise between rooms and good ventilation. So if you, for instance, have a wood stove in one room and you put a fan in the wall directly to the next room, that works for heat. The problem is that what it's doing is taking all the noise and send it right over. And so if that's not a problem in your house, then you can have this wide open. If it is a problem, you have to start playing games with it. And there are several ways to try to deal with it. Let me point out to you a couple exaggerated ones, but it helps to drive home what you can do in certain situations to make it work. I was setting up uh, a house, it was in Edmonton, where there was a shift worker who worked nights and he was being driven crazy by his three kids, okay? Because he was sleeping days. The kids were always being told to shut up because Papa's sleeping and all that. 
So we finally figured out what to do. We went in and we soundproofed his bedroom. We gave him an exterior door on the inside with full weather stripping, guillotine on the bottom, the whole thing. This room, nothing came through. Now, of course, he couldn't breathe in there. So we gave him a small air-to-air -air heat exchanger just for one room. Went straight outdoors. So we got fresh air in, steel air out, right through the wall. That didn't have anything to do with the rest of the system. And we put baseboard electric heaters, even though it was a gas-heated house, his room had baseboard electric heaters, so there was no ducts. So he had no duct connection to the house. And it, once that was all installed, it really surprised him when he got up, walked out, and there was a party going on, and he didn't know it. Okay? So he had total isolation. But we had to give him heat and ventilation of his own. Now, a partial way to do that is in the heating ducts. If you run a heating duct up from the furnace, over here, and we're going to take a takeoff for this room, and a takeoff for that room, and a takeoff for that room, while they all talk to each other. And so particularly if you're going from the master bedroom to the kids' room, that's not too cool. You don't want to know everything that you say or do in that room. So sometimes you want to separate this stuff off. My classic case was in Winnipeg, where in the early days, back in 1980s, when we started the R2000 program and energy efficiency, it was sort of common knowledge that you could not build an energy efficient house for a Ukrainian. Didn't work. So Ukrainians, as a class, refused R2000, refused energy efficiency, because it didn't work. And it was kind of hard to find out why, what their problem was, but they just refused. I don't want anything to do with it. And then we started getting the word that, well, it's because the bedroom gets moldy in an energy efficient house. Well, you see, the problem is that they, one, like to have a cool bedroom. So they cool the bedroom down. A lot of people do that. The bedroom's cooler than the rest of the house. But if it's cold and you don't have air circulation, you get what? Mold. And what do Ukrainians do is they all have this thing that looks a little bit like this. It's, it's like a little cushion, like a doggy long doggy that they put under the master bedroom door. It's usually used for the front door to stop a draft. Okay? And so it was funny, I was at a home show in Winnipeg, standing up in front of a big audience, and I started to talk about this, and the director of the home show almost freaked out. He wanted to turn my mic off because he was afraid of what I was about to say. Uh, but it turned out that because it was true, it worked. I just challenged all the Ukrainians. I said, and you all have those little doggies that you put under the bedroom door, huh? And they sort of, you know, little nods. I said, it's because in the Ukrainian culture, you can't let the kids hear sex. And therefore, you have to block off the door. Well, when you block off the door, that was the air path for the hot air into the room to get out. And which means that no hot air went into the room. No ventilation air went into the room because they blocked the door off. And in fact, in all the modern houses, we cut the doors about half an inch, three quarters of an inch shorter than we used to to let the air come through. And so the one contractor started, actually, the way we found this out was this one contractor started successfully selling R2000s to Ukrainians. What he did is he took one furnace run that came all the way from the furnace, all the way up to the master bedroom, and did nothing in between. And so any sound had to go down to the furnace and all the way back up to the kids' room. And that worked. And then he weather stripped the door, and they were happy. So he had a door that was sealed off tight and their own private, both cold air and hot air system in that one bedroom. And suddenly, yeah, the sound still went through the ducts, but having to go all the way down to the basement and all the way back up, it meant it was pretty private. And suddenly they could live with that and now they had fresh, cool air in the bedrooms all the time. But it's usually those extreme cases that help us figure those things out, that noise can be blocked off and sometimes it's just by extra ducting, you have to plan for it. But you can isolate things, particularly important for people that are like on shift jobs and need to live in a different sequence than the rest of the house. And so it allows them to actually function that way. But you can manipulate ventilation if you think about it that way. You don't just have to live with it. And if you get an extreme case, there are insulation materials, soundproofing materials you can put inside ducts to help cut out a particular area and, and separate that off. 
my wife is a therapist and they do a lot of screaming and shouting in her room and it's in the house and she wanted when we moved in there she wanted that to really be kind of isolated so she's got 12 inch walls that are double wall soundproof she's got four panes that we, we actually on the top of the wall we have a, a whole series of windows that just lets light in from the sunny side of the house but they're four pane glass that I made myself they're all there every pane moves at a different angle and all that's like a sound chamber we can sell this house to any teenage kid you know because he could put the band in there and the family wouldn't even know he was playing but uh, it's possible to isolate these things off for her ventilation system she has a button a foot button when she steps in the button a damper closes her ventilation off for 20 minutes now I did timer on that because I knew she'd never think about pushing the button to turn open the damper back up so if she wants to be really private from the rest of the house she can get 20 minutes of isolation and then the air comes back whether she likes it or not <laughs> and she has to step on the button again again these are exaggerated cases but when you understand those you can start seeing ways to plan for particular problems in an in area so that people who say no we can't get the ventilation that way I don't think that's true. I think there's always a workaround. There's always something to do to make it work, to try to make it idiot-proof so that it actually functions and goes on through. Um, the next slide, actually my last one. This is what you probably expected me to talk about was the HRVs and the ERVs and all of that. The only thing that I really want to mention here, because you're all pretty well familiar with this now, is <clears throat> what is really the difference between HRV and ERV? heat recovery ventilator and an energy recovery ventilator. The HRV has two fans and it sends air out and it brings air in and those air streams never cross paths. They, they run in channels right next to each other to exchange the heat. But no, no pollution gets exchanged in that. An ERV has a different system quite similar sometimes it's a wheel sometimes it's it's a grid like that but that it actually has like a cloth kind of filter channel and so it grabs moisture and lets it drift through and so 50 percent of the moisture comes back in the fresh air stream so it dries the house out half as much okay these things we, we had them way back when we first invented HRVs in Saskatchewan back in, uh, what, 1982 or something. And they didn't work. They didn't work at all because they froze up, they destroyed themselves, they self-destructed. We found out that they were tremendous success in Florida. In Florida, they worked as heat recovery ventilators because they did half of that changeover in terms of humidity. And it took them until, oh, I think it was about 2005, when Venmar finally decided, we need to build a cold weather ERV. And they built one. And of course, CMHC and the government couldn't talk about it because at the beginning, there was only one company. When there's only one company, they can't even talk about it. So we only learn about it through coffee meetings and stuff like that. But uh, it's when a second company comes out with the same thing, then we can talk about it because it's no longer promoting one single company. But Venmore actually was the first one out with a cold weather ERV. And the cold weather ERV holds up pretty well. And in fact, you need to, if you're going to get one, when you look at all of the testing listings from the testing agency down in the States, there's one test that's a minus 25 degrees Celsius test. And not all machines are tested to that. But you shouldn't be buying an ERV for our climate unless it's past that test. And they're looking at even dropping the temperature lower for the northern regions. So that may happen. It hasn't happened yet, but they're looking at trying to set it up so we can actually get a judgment for more than minus 25 degrees, or shall I say less than minus 25 degrees. Um, but the ERV, you don't want in a house that's too humid. You want the drying effect of the HRV because it's really going to help you out to drop that humidity. And when you have a house that only has two people left in it, and they don't have a lot of family that come and eat all the time. Maybe their house is too dry, then the ERV is the proper one. And for the moment, we only have one model of Venmar that is out that has an interchangeable core. So it has one machine that can be both an HRV or change the core, it's an ERV. 
and that we'll probably see more of eventually. But there is one that allows you to go both ways. And so you can, and particularly in a rental housing where you're not sure what the population is going to be, it might be worth the investment because you can flip the whole ventilation system from a drying to a less drying ventilation system by just changing core. And so in rental housing where you're not sure what the population of this place is going to be, whether it's going to be a too humid or too dry a house because of the way it's being used, you have the capacity at almost no cost of doing a change up. So that's an interesting thing to understand about when you, because it's kind of hard to choose sometimes between an HRV and an ERV when you're close to the middle line. Which one's going to work best? Okay. So I didn't give you a lot of lectures about code and all that stuff. You, know, you can get that in the other sessions. I'd like to open it up to questions at this point and see if you have any particular details or things you're working on or trouble that you've been having. I got you all blown away. <laughs> yes. What has more advantage on your return air, whether you put the return air on the floor or up in the ceiling? I used to always be a strong proponent of that, and I still am, but I've slacked off a little bit with the more recent developments in research. There are a lot of the, uh, the HUVAC guys in Ontario who are saying it doesn't really matter where you put it. Because it only, it just sort of draws, it takes the pressure out of the room, which allows the hot air to come in. Okay? The fact of the matter is, when in a heating situation, we have cold air on the floor, if it's on the floor, that will tend to pick up the cold air first. And so it'll be slightly more efficient for that. And in a air conditioning situation, if it's on the top, it's taking the hot air off the top. Now it's a minor difference between the two, but we do have a lot of people that put a cold air return that runs in, has a grill on the wall on the floor, and has a grill on the top, and a damper system that allows them to turn the grills off and on, and then you get both answers. <laughs> okay. You can choose what you want. But generally speaking, if it's on the floor, actually one way to understand this is to go back to Grandpa's house. I always loved Grandpa's house because it works so simply. You know, Grandpa had a, a potbelly wood stove, right? and he heated the house, and the air went up, so he needed to get some air to the second floor. What did he do? He cut a hole in the floor upstairs, and he put a metal grill on it, right? You could look down and see the potbelly stove. And uh, you could also, as a kid, you could look down and see what the adults were doing when you're not supposed to be looking, um, and they can't see you. So the air would, hot air would rise and go up there. And then the other thing that Grandpa had to do was leave the stairway open because that cold air came down the stairway to go back. And so the stairway was the down path, and that hole was the up path. In our more uh, modern systems, we usually had the hot air or the cold air return flat on the floor. And it was basically because cold air would just spill in. There would be a little bit of a suction, but mostly the cold air would spill in and go away. But if you want to try to get the most efficient, then that vertical stack running up inside the wall with a grill on the bottom, a grill on the top, and you put dampers on them. The only problem with dampers is that people will play with them. Okay, so that is no longer idiot proof. The good news is if they get it backwards, it's not a big problem. It's just a little bit more efficient if you're drawing off the floor in the winter and drawing off the ceiling in the summer. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, and sorry, you know, I always love simple, hard, absolute answers. And I get really frustrated when I have to deal with reality and uh, all the experts tell me it's not that simple. <laughs> there are other possibilities. But uh, I, I, I keep looking back at a, a friend of mine back here who was a researcher for CMHC. And, and he keeps sort of smiling looking at me. But uh, he's one of these guys that always says, well, that's kind of right, Jan. But, you know, if you really look at the science, <laughs> it gets more complicated sometimes. But I, I wouldn't get too upset anymore about where you put the cold air return. It, it's been really showing more and more. It's the throw of the hot air. It's more important of where the location of the cold air is. Now, if you have a blind room, we're bringing hot air into a back bedroom, and it's closed off and has no way for the air to get out, the air ain't going to come in. OK, because it's going to fill up. The room's going to pressurize, and it stops there. And so you either have to open the door or cut the bottom of the door off. In rental housing, I cut the bottom of the door off. If you can build it with a cold air return for the master bedroom, fine. Then you don't have to worry about that. But, uh, it, you know, there's been 
efforts to tell homeowners open the door to the bedroom and let the air circulate, they won't do that. If they want that door closed, it'll be closed. Or if you want the door closed for your plan for circulation, and they'll always leave it open. Now, there are ways of cheating this whole thing. For instance, in my own house, up in the second story, we have a small, relatively small house, and I have an office up on the second floor, and the master bedroom is, is just across the hallway from the office. And we don't need much air conditioning in Montreal, but a little would be nice, particularly because my office tends to heat in the summertime with all the video equipment and computers that I have going. I mean, I could take out my baseboards. I don't need them. <laughs> I've got too many computers and stuff going that takes care of that. So we put an air conditioner in the office. And then my wife said, wouldn't that be nice if we put one in the bedroom for the summertime? And for many years, we actually would sleep in the basement in the summertime. It was just more comfortable, you know, than up in the top. So I tried to figure out, how am I going to do this? So being a gadget guy, I mean, you got to imagine my poor wife. Because anything we do in the house, even painting a wall, I will use three different paints and three different paint appliances to see how they work. You see, so she goes crazy anytime we do something. She says, no, 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 can't we just do it simple? No, 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 I've got to photograph this and I've got to film this. So my office, which now stays nice and cool because of this fancy unit air conditioner that's just there, I put a duct in the corner that drew off the floor, went up the wall, and shot into the bedroom. Okay? And then I can drop, turn off all my computers, get the office nice and cold at night, and if I turn this whole system on an hour before we go to bed, we actually air condition the bedroom next door. Theoretically, this air conditioner is not capable of doing that, but we found because I'm no longer using the office and it's just become a cold box and we're drawing the cold air off the floor and throwing it in the bedroom, it works fine because we don't need a heck of a lot of air conditioning. And so we, we managed to pull things off like that. Again, it's understanding cold air falls, hot air rises, and where do we want to get this to? Okay. Now your heat recovery ventilators do such almost a good job of, of air conditioning uh, just because they blow fresh air into the ceiling. And that can actually help, even in the summertime. Other questions? Yes, sir. Ma'am. Okay, he wants a cold, your son wants a cold room. Okay, so he gets it really cold, and that's a problem with the rest of the house. And what's your heating system? Um, forced air gas? Or, yeah, forced air gas. And so he wants his room cold, but the furnace air is going up there. And so he's opening the window and wasting the energy. Why don't you just get him a damper on the floor that he can close? He can turn off the furnace. Understand that a furnace air handler puts out X amount of pressure that goes to the whole house. Anytime I change any duct, whether it's dampers in the ducts or whether it's on the end at, at the, at the outlet itself, the, you know, those things on the floor that have little dampers in them on the floor down there, whether it's any one of those, you change one, the whole house changes. Because either we give it more air or less air. So we close off his bedroom, you're getting a little more heat elsewhere, and the furnace is just gonna go off sooner. Okay? And his room will cool down because it's not being heated. You don't have to air condition it. It's cold enough around here that it's just, if you let him turn that off, then it'll just cool down that room and leave him happy. With, now, you've got to keep an eye on the corners and stuff for mold. Because if it gets really cold and you still have the hot humidity in the house that's getting there, then you can get some condensation and some mold. So you keep any room that you've left extra cold, you've got to watch and back of closets and things like this that are particularly on outside walls. So you want to, in his closet, you want to push back over to the outside wall and see that you're not getting into trouble. You could add insulation and that could solve it. Okay? But those kind of manipulations of the ductwork work very well. By the way, when you do have forced air heating, one of the things I always tell consumers, and this would be very good to build into your, your rental houses, that usually have balancing dampers down in the basement near the heating system as the duct branches go out, there's a damper in the middle of it with a little handle on the side. Okay, but theoretically, those should be set differently in the summer and the winter. 
particularly if you're using it all for HRV. If you're using the ductwork for your HRV, so it's distributing air even in the summertime, uh, then you might want to have that different. Now, this is absolutely important with air conditioning, because air conditioning airflow demands are very different from heating airflow demands. And so what you do, and, and by the way, a contractor can't do this nearly as well as a homeowner, because the homeowner can do it over a season. And what I tell them is you go down, and first of all, you shut the damper that feeds the room that has the thermostat. Because the more heat we give the thermostat, the faster it turns off, but the other rooms are cold. So we shut this one off. Now, we're not going to leave it shut off, but we shut it off to start with. So we just turn the damper down. That means less heat gets to the room that has the thermostat, so it's going to heat the outer edges of the house more as you're going. When they find that, OK, that's working better, but it's kind of cold here and kind of warm there, they can open up that one a little bit. But just turn it a little bit and wait a week. Every time you make a little change, wait a week. And give it time to settle in. And then you'll start to find, of all those dampers, a little more heat back there, a little less heat here, you finally get it distributed right. And when you get it right in the heating season, you take a black felt marker and you draw a line on the duct where the handle's pointing. And you say, winter. And then you do it all over in the summertime. And in the summertime, you'll find they're in different positions. And when you finally get every room as comfortable as you can get, with, particularly if you've got air conditioning, then every room is as good as you can get, you'll mark that summer. And once you've done this for one whole year, then every year when you change, turn on the heat or turn on the air conditioning, you just go down and you change all the dampers to line up. And you'll find you're really close to a comfortable situation without them trying to second guess it all the time. When you do that on the grills, that never sticks because kids play with them. Now, in the case of your son, where he wants it that way, he might be smart enough to, to do it right. But when they're kind of all over the house, you'll find everybody plays with them. And so they'll never stay the way you planned it. So that's what's good about the dampers in the grill work. If the professional comes in, he takes an educated guess, and he leaves. But he doesn't know how this house is going to perform. You find that out by living in it as you're going on. So those dampers are important things to have in new construction that you do have those dampers in. And then if you haven't figured it out, there's a square piece of sheet metal across the duct. It goes like that, it goes like that, and the handle goes in the same direction as the metal. So if you're pointing across the duct, it's wide open. Going across the duct this way, it's totally blocked. OK? Other questions? Because these are the good ones. You see, when you get these little details, that's where you can communicate to the people that are having problems. And what's amazing is the number of problems can be solved by tweaking the system, not necessarily going in and doing major renovations. Sometimes you've got to go in and change the fan because it just wasn't big enough or it's gotten worn out or it's making too much noise and they're turning it off. But you've got to ask the right question. Well, OK, it's all moldy in your bathroom. You do have a fan. Do you ever turn it on? No, no, it makes so goddamn much noise. There's no way in the world I'm going to turn that thing on. And the worst thing you can do is to tie it into the light switch. Okay, because then everybody has to go to the bathroom in the dark. It's the only way they can put up with the noise. And so <laughs> trying to go to the toilet in the dark is kind of a pain. And, but sometimes they're tied in with the light switch to make sure they go on. Well, the thing is, you turn that off as soon as you leave and it hasn't finished. So ideally, you have a dishumidistat. Okay, it's going to cost you 20, 30 bucks. But you get a dishumidistat that has an on off switch, but also has a humidity setting. And if it's really humid, the thing goes on by itself and it stays on until it dries out and drops down. And the hard thing, of course, is get people to use it because they say, oh, we're wasting electricity. And you just got to drive home. Do you want the medical bill for the mold or do you want the electrical bill for the fan? And you got a choice here. We either ventilate this properly and you stay healthy or you save all kinds of money on hydro. It's not even that expensive, but you save money on hydro, but you're spending your time at the infirmary all the time because you've got colds and flu and everything else by this mold. OK, no more questions? Jeez, we're going to finish up uh, not only, oh, uh, just a tiny bit early. This is good. Uh, I hope that what that really gives you is just how important some of these details are. We miss that. We think just bending the duct a little bit doesn't matter. It does matter. And setting these things up, making sure your ducts are clean, that they're sealed, all of that becomes critical. And when you're planning things out, plan your layout, really thinking all the way through airflow and everything else. And if you get that right, you'll find your houses will stay healthier with even less cost 
in terms of the installation and everything else. So there, there are ways to really deal well with this and even in retrofit situations. Thank you very much.